you again to turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 2, as we come to a close of John's account of Jesus' first week of ministry. This inaugural week of ministry, we notice, began back in chapter 1, verse 19, with John the Baptist's testimony of who Jesus was. And from there, as we work through this chapter, we saw a series of the next day, verse 29, then the next day, verse 35, then again the next day in verse 43. Now chapter 2 then is believed to, by some, be the seventh day of this week, and by others, it's believed to be the sixth day of this first week of Jesus' ministry. Really, in the larger context of this gospel, we're in the body of it, which actually began back in verse 19. And this section is often referred to as the book of signs. It takes, it takes us all the way through the end of chapter 2. It's referred to as the book of signs because John, our author, has purposely chosen, I believe, seven different signs or miracles that Jesus performed publicly in his life and he chose these to record for us that, that these signs point us to the person and work of Jesus. Again, we have to keep in mind the, the greater purpose of John's writing this account found in chapter 20, verse 31. He says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The these in this verse is referring back to verse 30 when John says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. And so the these in verse 30, one is referring to the signs in verse 30. Now it should be obvious to us that by reading the first three gospel accounts that John does not record every miracle or sign that Jesus performed while he lived on this earth. Again, he stated that in verse 30. But John has hand-selected these seven miracles or signs that he feels do a wonderful job of pointing us to different aspects to the power, authority, and character and work of Jesus. So in our passage this morning, we have the first sign, this changing the water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana. The second sign is then found in chapter 4, verses 43 to 54, when Jesus heals the official's son. The third sign is recorded by John in the fifth chapter, when Jesus heals the man who'd been lame for 38 years. The fourth sign is in chapter 6, with the feeding of the 5,000. Now there are some who will then add an eighth sign with the miracle of Jesus walking on the water. And it does certainly, this miracle does point to his authority and, and power. But I don't believe it's one of the seven signs that John wants to communicate to us because it's not done necessarily in public. So I, I'm not convinced it belongs in this list. The fifth sign is in chapter 9 when Jesus heals the blind man. The sixth is in chapter 11 when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And now I, I know I said that this section ends with the conclusion of chapter 12, and, and it does for the most part. But the seventh sign isn't until chapter 20 when Jesus is raised from the grave. When he's brought out of the grave, raised from the dead, and many many, many people see him and witness that. Now it's important that we understand that John uses a word here in verse 11 that translate, that we translate sign or signs. Now signs were certainly miraculous. There's no question of that. But this word that John uses points us to something a bit deeper, a, a bit broader, a bit beyond just the miracle itself. It's a word that goes beyond the act and points us to something much more significant. Points us to, or the point of Jesus' miracles are to communicate something about himself. It wasn't just for the awe or the show of power or the display of authority. These signs had a bigger purpose. They were done so that his glory might be revealed and made known to those whom he chose to reveal it to. 
John tells us of this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. In John 3, 2, Nicodemus says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you, that you do unless God is with him. So even the religious leaders certainly understood that the work or these miracles of this man, Jesus, proved and confirmed that he was, at least in their eyes, sent from God. In chapter 731, we read, yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? See, the people knew and understood that the miracles of Jesus proved and confirmed who he truly was, the Messiah. In chapter 10, verse 25, we read, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. See, Jesus himself even stated that his works, his miracles were signs that revealed and proved and confirmed who he was, the Son of God. John has just told us, at the end of chapter 1, of Jesus telling Nathanael that he and the other disciples will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He says that the things of heaven were now going to be revealed through Jesus, the Son of Man. John has already portrayed Jesus as the Word. In him we see and know the Father and he is now reiterating this fact by writing to us and telling us of these signs. And so in setting out to prove or confirm who Jesus truly is, and really to prove and confirm what he has just said in chapter 1 about Jesus, John begins chapter 2 with this first sign that he's chosen to include into this account that bear witness to all of us who Jesus truly is. So let's stand together and read our section of Scripture this morning, found in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and we will read through verse 11. We read, On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Canaan in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Let's pray. Father, again, we are grateful eternally grateful for your word, its truth. And in it we find you. So Lord, once again this morning, my prayer is that in your grace and your mercy you would open our eyes to see your glory. You would open our ears to hear of your majesty and your worth so that, Lord, we might behold you, so that we might be transformed into your likeness, so that the world may see you through us and the power of the gospel. Lord, again, please do not allow any of my words to cloud the glory and the majesty of who you are. pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Maybe may be seated. So we are told right off the bat that this event, this, this wedding that we read of was on the third day. Not that it's all that important 
to land on what day of this first week this is, there are some who begin counting in verse 19 as the first day, then verse 29 the second, and verse 35 the third, and verse 43 the fourth, and then count three days from there. And now this wedding then, they understand, is the seventh day of the week. There are then others, and I fit into this camp, who take this third day to be the third day since Jesus decided to go to Galilee in verse 43. This then puts this event on the sixth day of the week. And again, it, it doesn't do anything to prove or interpret the overall message or application of this event. But I think it's important we'll show up again. But we're, regardless of which day it is, John begins with th this first sign at a wedding in Cana in Galilee. Now, there's a couple different Canas that we know of, but this one is probably about eight to nine miles north of Nazareth, Nazareth, again, in the land of Canaan, or in, the, in Galilee. It was also the hometown of Nathaniel, as we learned about last week. But we don't know who the bride is, we don't know who the bridegroom is, but we do understand that more than likely, the groom, at least, was either family or a close friend of Jesus' family. We also see that these five men who attached themselves to Jesus went along for the ride and were with him at this event. Weddings in this culture and at this time were, were huge events. After a betrothal period, which was much more than just an engagement period that, that we are familiar with, during this betrothal period, the, the two parties were actually legally married. There was a, an actual legal contract that would have been required during this time. In fact, a divorce or a separation at this time would have required a, a divorce certificate. But after this period of time, this betrothal period, the bridegroom, in, in much pomp and circumstance, would have gathered his wedding party and headed off to the bride's home to get his wife. He then would return with his wife to the father's home. The ceremony took place somewhere in this time frame. It was a huge celebration that would oftentimes last a whole week. It would include these processions and this ceremony and a huge feast that we read of in this chapter. The trouble with this event comes in verse 3 where John tells us that the wine for the celebration has run out. Now this may not seem like a huge deal to us in our culture, but in this culture, the bridegroom's family was responsible for throwing this huge celebration. And if anything went wrong, it was a poor reflection upon this family. The, see, the bride's family needed to be impressed. They needed to be treated with great honor. So if something like this, like the wine running out, would happen, the bridegroom's family would be disgraced. They could even be sued by the family of the bride. It revealed a, a poor, unprepared, un, or a disrespectful family. And so Mary, and notice, she remains, or she's unnamed in this whole account, goes to her oldest son. Jesus, she tells him to do something. Now, I'm not sure what Mary knows about Jesus at this time. She certainly had knowledge of him being the Messiah, even before his birth. But was her knowledge of the Messiah just similar to the, the common run-of-the-mill run Jews' understanding of the Messiah? Or did she know something more? She certainly would have noticed a different behavior in him growing up, always having to discipline his brothers and sisters, but never having to correct him. Did she understand who he truly was? I think that's a question that we'll enter into heaven with. There are many who take this interaction between Mary and Jesus as Mary being the one who, who told Jesus to start his ministry. To let's get it going here, son. That she is the one who uh, told him what to do here this day. Don't think that that is necessarily the correct interpretation of this interaction. She is not at, she's not the point of this narrative. In fact, keep in mind, she remains nameless. 
But I'm not sure if she was expecting Jesus to perform a miracle or if she was just uh, leaning on him to take some leadership, being the oldest. It's quite possible that Joseph had died by this time and Jesus was now head of the family. But there are a couple of different things I think need to be pointed out in this interaction between Jesus and his mother. They're not necessarily things that this miracle or sign point us to about Jesus, but John does put them in this narrative for a reason and for a purpose. So I want to just spend a few minutes looking at them. Again, Mary informs Jesus. She instructs Jesus that the wine had run out. The bridegroom's marriage, in a sense, is riding in the balance here. And she has given Jesus an opportunity to help out. And Jesus responds to Mary's instruction in this way. He says, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now at first glance, this, this interpretation, look, or according to our culture, might look as if Jesus is being a bit disrespectful or impolite to his mom. But his term that he uses, that we translate woman, in the days of Jesus was, was not used as harsh or in a dishonoring way. It was used how we might use the word ma'am. It was a term of respect and honor. But again, notice, all throughout this passage, the author John refers to Mary as Jesus' mother. Verse 1, verse 3, verse 5, and verse 12. Jesus, however, does not use this term mother which should alert us to something that Jesus and the author are trying to tell us. And not many of us would call our mothers ma'am, or at least here in the north. What is happening here, and we see it again while Jesus is on the cross as he addresses John and Mary. And in that moment, Jesus calls Mary this same word, woman. It is here at this time, I believe, for the first time, where Jesus begins to dis distance himself from Mary in this earthly relationship. In fact, the NASB interprets this phrase as, what does this have to do with us? The LSB says, what do I have to do with you? See, Jesus is not now addressing the wine issue, but he's now addressing the relationship he and his mother now have. This relationship is no longer a mother-son relationship. Jesus is now to become her head and she is to become his servant. He is to lead and she is to follow. She is to now be submissive to him. And Jesus points out, my hour has not yet come. John uses this term hour uh, generally to point us to the death of Jesus on the cross. And Jesus simply tells his mother that his time for his death, the time for the cross has not arrived the hour had not fully come, but the clock has now started ticking. The process has begun and his public ministry is being kicked off. And this will change the relationship between Jesus and this woman named Mary. She will need to come to a place where she believes who he truly is. See, Mary will need this hour to come just as much as the rest of mankind will. Mary will need the death of Jesus for her, for her eternity, just as much as you and I do. And Jesus is now making this clear to her and helping her understand that I am much more than just your son. I am your savior. Jesus was now no longer primarily the son of Mary. He was the son of God. The son of man who is now bringing the realities of heaven to the people on earth. And Mary should no longer presume she knows what all that entails. And we see this glorious movement in Mary. Notice, Mary moves from giving instruction to Jesus, the wine is run out, to instructing others to do as Jesus says. She moves from the role of authority to the role of submission. What a wonderful picture of redemption. A wonderful example of what our role is in our relationship with this man. At the moment of our salvation, we too enter into a new relationship with him. One where we submit to his authority and instruct others to do the same. And so Jesus, 
knowing that the hour had not yet arrived. It was time, however, to get the ball rolling. And so now in one single sign, he begins his public ministry that will eventually, some three years later, bring this hour to full fruition. But as we walk through the rest of these verses this morning, we're going to see five significant truths regarding Jesus and his ministry that this sign reveals about him. First of all, we see that he is the creator. In chapter 1, verse 3, John has already told us that all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And this sign certainly does prove and affirm this statement that Jesus is creator. He is the agent that the Father used to bring all things into being. Jesus is the one who made something out of nothing. And this might be the most obvious point that John is trying to communicate. We see this sign point us to this truth about Jesus. First, we, we see that he is able to make something out of nothing. We just said, John points out that these, these water jars were filled to the brim with water. There was no room in them for someone to pour anything else in them. They were once water, and at some point before, between verse 8 and verse 9, they were filled with wine. There's no natural explanation as to what had happened. We also see that Jesus is not limited in the quantity of his power and authority over all things in creating. All things that were made were made through him. Because of the translation of this volume that we get, are given in our passages, that John tells us of here, it's, it's estimated that there was anywhere between 120 to 180 gallons of wine created that day by Jesus. This amount would have been impressive for any wedding feast, and this would have certainly reflected well upon the bridegroom and his family. But we know and we understand and we believe that what Jesus does is never lacking. It is always in abundance. It is always more than what we need. We also see that what Jesus creates is never second best. Just as we are told in Genesis, the first day, and it was good. The second day, and it was good. The third day, and it was good. This wine we read in verse 10, we are told, was good. This wine that he created was not bad wine. In fact, it was even better than the best wine that this family had provided earlier in the feast. The best wine was made by Jesus. What Jesus does is never just okay. It is always good, it is always best. Friends, mankind is not improving itself. We're simply learning more of the glorious design that we were created in. The fact is, John says, this Jesus is, once again, creator. He was with the Father in the beginning. He created in the beginning. He continues to have this power and authority. This man is the Son of God. This man is God. Water to wine, empty jars to full jars of wine, more than enough wine, the best wine, wine that was for the good of those there that day for the feast. Jesus is creator. This sign does point us to this truth. And we certainly can't miss these points. But I believe there's more here for us to see that by Jesus performing this sign, he had more for us to know about him and about his works. So in addition to understanding the creative power and authority of Jesus, we see that he also has transforming power and authority. Look at verse 6. John now begins to tell us of this sign. And we read that there were six water jars. These, these jars were there for the Jewish rites of purification. These jars would have once held water that was used so that the guests of this wedding would be able to wash their hands before they ate this feast. Mark helps us understand the purpose of these jars in this water in Mark 7, verses 1 through 5. Mark writes, Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes, who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. 
for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? We, we, twice in this, in this passage, Mark points us to an interesting fact. He refers to this practice of washing and purification as a tradition of elders. I'm not aware of anywhere in, in the Old Testament or in the law where this practice was commanded by God. Mark makes it clear that this practice was a man-made tradition instituted by the elders and not God. And Jesus tells his servants to fill these jars up with water to the brim. And from these same jars, this good wine is served. See, it's in this sign we see the transforming power of Jesus. He takes the empty, dead, works-based, ceremonial, ritualistic religion of Judaism and trans transforms it into the fruitful, life-giving relationship of Christianity. He takes the law and makes it grace. He takes man's efforts to attain purity and does it for them. He takes the burden of performance and makes it the celebration of faith and grace. Leon Morris says it this way. He changes the water of Judaism. There it is. He changes the water of Judaism into the wine of Christianity. The water of Christlessness into the wine of or the richness and the fullness of eternal life in Christ. The water of the law into the wine of the gospel. Water you wash your hands with into wine you drink. The external into the internal. The old into the new. The water of purification has been replaced. It has been transformed into the wine of the new and this wine is good and it flows freely and it produces joy and celebration. And this is what Jesus is telling us in Mark 2 verse 22. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. This is Paul's testimony. Turn with me to Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and, and, and just again, look at verses 4 through 6. Paul says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the, tr of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. There was no man who had the credentials that Paul had according to man, according to Judaism. He was, according to the Jewish religion at this time, righteous. That's who Paul was. But look at what Paul had now become in verses 7 through 8. Paul says all of this was nothing. All of what he had just proclaimed and grabbed a hold of or let go of, actually in verses 4 through 6, it was all rubbish. Why? Look at verse 9. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul was able to take everything that he had attained on his own, these man-centered works and declare them as rubbish and discard them and grab hold of the righteousness that was his through faith. Works versus faith. Man-centered rubbish versus Christ's obedience, Christ's righteousness. 
Paul had realized that the rules of man, the, the efforts to be righteous were of no value. They were worthless. And that true righteousness was dependent upon faith. It's dependent upon what you believe about this man, Jesus. Paul had been transformed from a worthless rule follower into a righteous Christ follower. And this is our testimony as well, brothers and sisters, of what Jesus does in and for us as well. He takes the empty, worthless, external efforts we use to become right with him, and he transforms us from the inside, not with ritual or ceremony, but by his will and his work, the old becoming new, the dead becoming life, the darkened giving light. John told us in chapter 1, verse 13, that this is not by blood. It makes no difference who your father is, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but by God. Jesus has come. God has come, and he has come to transform a people for his glory. No longer men and women who are trying to look a certain way on the outside without change on the inside. Men and women who are lo no longer trying to earn God's favor, but who are given it freely and without measure. Men and women who are no longer attempting to purify themselves, but who drink from the fruit of Jesus' purity and who now, like Mary, can and do say, do whatever he tells you to. Jesus is the transformer. Number three, we also see this points us to the fact that he is the true Messiah. And this Messiah is more than just a man who came to free Israel from Rome. This man didn't come to overthrow the Romans. We have a much more dangerous enemy than that. He came to defeat sin, death, and Satan. He came to transform a people for himself. Again, these men and women these Jews had a shallow and faulty view of what the Messiah was coming for. And John is beginning to help the reader understand not just the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, but what the Messiah was truly needed for. One thing we need to be careful of is not to, when we look at these signs, is not to make too much of them. Not to take too many liberties in assigning what the sign points to. One can get a bit out of control or out of balance when he or she does this. And it can lead to some rather problematic theology. Scripture must help us rein us in and keep us in on this. But here I want to draw your attention back to the wine. And not just the wine, but the abundant quantity of it. Jesus is not communicating that as creator he creates abundantly. He's not just communicating that. We read in the Old Testament, and particularly the prophets, that one of the indicators of the coming Messiah in his kingdom is, is that of prosperity. Not a, a frivolous wealth, but of abundant provision. And this is given to us in, in, in many different ways. But in several places, it gi it's given to us in the picture of wine flowing and being readily available. In Joel 2, verses 18 to 24, we read, Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things." Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The trees bear its fruit, the fig tree and vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you the abundant rain, the early and latter rain as before. The threshing floors will be full of grain, the vats shall overflow with wine and oil." Similar statement in chapter 3, verse 18. 
Amos chapter 9, verses 13 to 15, we read of the similar uh, picture of the Messiah and his kingdom coming. Great prosperity, and one of those pictures is wine flowing freely and abundantly. In each one of these prophetic promises of the messianic kingdom, wine is described as being abundant, pointing us to the fact that there will be both spiritual prosperity and great provision. There will be no, no need. There will be more than 120 to 180 gallons of wine. I believe that this miracle points us to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the King, the Son of David, whom this people knew was coming and were waiting for. And with the King comes his kingdom. I think even beyond that, we also see that with the Messiah in his kingdom comes great joy and celebration as well. The Messiah is here. The King is here. And this miracle points these people to that. Fourthly, he is the Messiah, but he's also the bridegroom. If you look down towards the end of this section, when the master of the feast, who could have been the best man or he could have been a close friend or relative of the groom's family when he tasted the wine in verse 10 he says he said to the the bridegroom everyone serves the good wine first and when people have drunk freely then the poor wine doesn't need much explanation of why this took place but you have kept the good wine until now and in this interaction, we're reminded that it is the duty and responsibility of the groom to provide the wine for the feast. This man might have assumed that it was the groom's decision to save the best wine for last. He certainly assumed that this best wine was provided by the groom. But I believe John is pointing out the fact that this wine was not provided by this groom but it was provided by another groom, the bridegroom. John uses the same analogy in chapter 3, verse 29, as he quotes John the Baptist, who says, The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. John, as we will see in chapter 14, 1 through 4 says uh, Jesus, he records these words of Jesus as he speaks to his disciples the night of his arrest. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. This is wedding talk. The bridegroom, again, during this betrothal period, goes to the house of his father and he prepares a room. He adds on to the house of his father so that he and his new bride will have a place to live. Once that room is ready, and once the father says go, the bridegroom goes and gets his bride, takes her back. And Jesus is telling us he is this bridegroom. And we also know and we also hope and, and truly believe that this has its fulfillment eschatologically as well. John in his vision tells us in Revelation 19 of a future wedding in verses 6 through 9. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
And he said to me, these are the true words of God. This is the bridegroom. There will be a glorious wedding feast one day when Christ and the church are finally and completely joined together. The Lamb of God takes those for whom he died into his Father's house for all eternity. Jesus is our bridegroom. And one day he's coming back for his bride. And there will be great and awesome celebration and joy. What a glorious hope we have in Jesus being our bridegroom. Finally, this morning, we see this, point, this, this sign point us to not only the truth of Jesus' glory, but the faith that his glory produces. Verse 11 says this, the first of his signs Jesus did at Canaan, Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. John has already told us again of this word who became flesh. And in dwelling with us, this word reveals to us the glory, his, his glory as the only Son of God from the Father. Jesus is beginning to, to, in a sense, peel back the layers of his humanity so that those around him and us, his readers, might begin to see the glory of who he is and what he can and will do as God. And this is what John meant when he said, as Josh read for us in chapter 1, verse 14, that we have seen his glory. This is what Jesus was referring to when he told Nathanael that he and the others would see heaven opened up on the Son of Man. Edward Clink says this, said another way, what you just saw, that was the glory of God and his name is Jesus. In this sense, the signs are the aftershock of God with us. And we see the purpose of these signs in this account fulfilled in this response of his disciples. They believed. See, please notice that it was not the sign that they confessed. It was the one whom the sign pointed to. These five disciples already had some sort of knowledge that Jesus was special. They were following him. They had left John the Baptist to follow this man. Andrew had already acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah. But now they were coming face to face with his glory. They were coming face to face with the truth of who he truly was. So John says they believed. So what about all the others who were there that would have seen this miracle? the master of the feast, the bridegroom, the bride, both families of all the friends, Jesus' brothers. We're not told that they believed. In fact, we know that his brothers didn't believe at this point in time. But to those who saw this glory, to those whom it was revealed to, they are the ones who responded in faith. Those who only see the miracle and miss the man, they miss the very truth that would have given them life. Again, as I was sitting and thinking about this, this week, there are many out there who focus on the miracle. There are many out there who chase the emotion or the experience and they equate their faith with the event. And all the while, they miss the man. The man who creates. The man who transforms. The man who gives life abundantly. The man who will one day bring his bride into heaven and celebrate with her. The man whose glory manifests the very glory of God. But it isn't just those who seek the spectacular or those who seek the miraculous that can miss this man either. There are those of us who have to be careful that we don't miss him through doctrine. 
We may want to know and learn and be able to lead and teach and have all this knowledge, but even in the midst of all of this glorious truth and doctrine about this man, we miss who this is about. We miss the man who this doctrine is pointing us to. We can oftentimes miss this man in the midst of our spiritual disciplines. You can be in church every time the doors are open. You can read and pray and witness and give and visit widows and orphans and miss this man. We're told by Jesus himself, a group of people come to him, but Lord, didn't we do this and this and this and this and this? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. These things are only tools to know and serve him. They are not, they cannot be the ends. They are only means to the end of knowing this man. And we can miss the man amidst the very blessings that he gives us. Family, creation, friends. Brothers and sisters, if all we do and all we have does not point us to Christ, then we are missing his glory. We are missing him. Be impressed with the power and authority of Jesus. But worship Jesus. Be impressed with his work. But allow that to move from your head to your heart and to truly worship him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these glorious truths. As we continue to learn and deepen our understanding more and more of who you are, Lord, help this to not just be information, facts, knowledge. But may all of this lead us to a life lived for you, a life of worship of who you are and what you've done, a life of a pursuit of a relationship with you, Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.